Welcome back to the Space School, otherwise known as PPSW, and today we're back with another Star Wars theory. Before we go any further, though, uh, shout out to our Discord. Check it out down below. It has uh, awesome Star Wars community. We talk about everything, literally everything. I shout out videos there. You get to interact with me. Great community. It's a much easier way to communicate with me instead of talking to me through YouTube comments, which I don't always get to. Also, subscribe for a chance to win one of three free lightsabers that I'll be giving away once we hit 10K, and we're almost at 5K, so I'm going to be giving them away soon, apparently. Wow, this is crazy. Anyways, today we are going to be going back to our trained series with the eventual High Council member Shock T training the Jedi's chosen one. Shock T was born in 59 BBY, making her about 18 years older than Anakin. How could Shock T change the outcome of Anakin's life? She was a very powerful, wise, and kind Jedi. How would Anakin have dealt with a woman like Shock T being in his life? And being his master. The story begins as Anakin and Obi-Wan are transported with the rest of the Jedi Council from Naboo towards Coruscant. Anakin was excited he'd be trained as a Jedi, it seemed, as if he would be trained by Obi-Wan Kenobi, but the Council had a different intention for the boy. As they arrived on Coruscant, Obi-Wan ushered Anakin to the youngling training grounds. As they went there, Obi-Wan then went to his master's quarters to clean it up. The council reconvened and they began talking about who would train the boy. No one on the council wanted to train him, but there was a Jedi master in mind that they thought would be worth reaching out to. Her name was Shock T, and her future was very bright. The council already foresaw that they thought she would be in the council, and she was already extremely powerful and wise for the age that she was at. The council had been talking about adding her to their ranks for a little bit of time. It wasn't impossible that Shock T would fit their model of Jedi. She was a master of all seven lightsaber forms after all. They decided that with her maturity, she'd be a better choice for Anakin than Kenobi would have been. The council called upon Shock T to come into the council chambers and when she was called, she entered the council chambers. Her presence is noticeable. She draws the attention of the room. Shock T stands in the middle of the chambers, and the council makes her aware that she will be training the prophesized chosen one. She nods and accepts her new role as master to Anakin Skywalker. Shock T didn't hold back from Anakin. She made her presence aware to her new student immediately. She went down to the youngling training grounds and found the boy named Skywalker. He was excited, but everything was new to him. But he was also nervous. He didn't know what would await him in the near future. Before Anakin could get adjusted, he was confronted by a tall woman. She was an alien species that he was really actually unfamiliar with. She introduced herself to Anakin and he looked up to her and he felt that there was something off. As she kneeled down next to the boy, she told him that her name was Shock T and that she was going to be his master. Anakin asked about Obi-Wan and why he wasn't to be his master. She told him that the council believed that he were too young to train Anakin. Though, Shock T told Anakin that Obi-Wan would still be there for him. She wanted Obi-Wan to be there for Anakin, and she emphasized that she wanted Obi-Wan to be present in Anakin's life. Anakin was thankful that she made this approach to him, that she went out of her way to make him aware of the situation that he now found himself a part of. As the weeks passed by, Anakin's training as a youngling would begin, and his training, he would excel. He would grow to the top of his class continuously. Shakti made sure to be present during Anakin's training. This decision would be very important for him in the future. Anakin would progress extremely fast, and it was obvious that his level was excelling. At every turn, he would grow to the top of his class, and Anakin moved quickly through his training, and instead of being inhibited by his trainers, Shock T made sure that Anakin would be allowed to move up in his training regiments. Anakin's progression went faster than it ever did in canon. Because, because of Anakin's extremely fast progression and continuous appearance at the top of his classes, Shock T kept a close eye on her future student. As she did, she realized Anakin was being bullied by each class he entered. He was a slave not just in life, but to his emotions, and the Jedi called him out on it. Anakin tormented over the bullying he received in training. He wanted to escape from the temple, but every time Anakin was bullied, his future master, Shock T, would come to his aid. Shock T was a staunch believer in the Jedi Code, but she also realized what it was that young Skywalker needed, and that was genuine attachment. She gave Anakin a hug and told him that everything would be alright. Without his mother, Shock T filled that role that he so desperately needed. Anakin throughout his youngling training found that he himself was extremely loyal to his master, his future master that is. She was a kind and loving in every sense of the word love that a Jedi could give. It wasn't just Anakin that felt this bond, but Shock T herself felt it as well. She felt almost a motherly instinctual connection with Anakin. With that connection, she was extremely protective of him. Anakin would eventually pass his trials and become apprentice to Shock T. It wouldn't take long for Anakin to reach this level, 
because Shakti continually pushed the trainers to make Anakin move on from the classes he excelled in. He was able to grow much faster and grow more maturely. With Shakti at his side, he was also not thinking of Padme. It wasn't that he was in love with Shakti, but he loved her to death, honestly. Shakti and Obi-Wan were the only two people in the temple that made Anakin feel at home. He didn't feel secluded and Shakti always took Anakin away from the other younglings so that he wouldn't always be bullied. It didn't matter though, Anakin was now a Padawan, years before any of his peers would ever reach that level. Shakti kept Anakin close almost at all times, though she knew there was one important thing she needed to do. It wasn't for her, but for her apprentice. She took her apprentice's hand and guided him to the hangar bay at the Jedi Temple. She told him that they were going on a mission, his first mission. Anakin was a bit nervous though. He was still a boy, and only a day or so into becoming an apprentice. They went through hyperspace and eventually landed on the dust bowl of a planet, in a popular spaceport. Anakin walked out behind his master and saw nothing but sand. He was relatively upset, because he really never wanted to see sand again, but then he realized he was in Mos Eisley. Why? Why was Shakti taking him here? He asked his master why they were here and she just smiled at him and reached her hand down for him. He grabbed it and walked closely with his master, both donning their own Jedi robes through the crowds of Mos Eisley. Shakti asked Anakin where he used to work. She knew he was a slave and she wanted to know who owned him. Anakin shyly told his master as the two of them made their way towards Wado's workshop. Shakti asked Wado about a woman named Shmi. Anakin stood behind her, and he was, at this point, much too afraid to see Watto. He was still very troubled by being a slave. Shakti was given an answer, and it turned out Shmi hadn't been sold yet. And so Shakti told Watto that she would like to pay for her freedom. Watto gave her a price, and without hesitation, Shakti paid for Shmi Skywalker's freedom. Anakin caught on to this, and tears started falling down his face. Shakti turned and saw this, so she picked Anakin up. He wasn't much larger than he was when he left Tatooine, and she was still able to pick him up. She told him that it was only fair for him to have his real mother to be free of the pain that he grew up in. When Anakin and Shakti went to Shmi's house, they told her that she had been freed and that it was Anakin's new master who had done it. After spending hours with his mother and telling her about everything that had transpired since they had left Tatooine, it was time for the two Jedi to leave. They left, and so Shmi was allowed to live her life as a free person. Shakti and Anakin returned to their ship and left Tatooine. In space, Anakin told his master that he was so thankful for her. Shakti just smiled at her apprentice. Shakti was true to the code, but Anakin needed special care, and she knew she couldn't be ignorant of the care that he needed. When they returned to the temple, the real training for Anakin began. Shakti was one of the most incredible Jedi in the Order. She was a superior duelist, and being that Anakin had very little lightsaber experience, he would grow to his master's prodigy. Years would pass as Shakti would become a member of the Jedi Council and Anakin would become a great power in the Jedi Temple. Anakin would be kept away from the Chancellor because Shakti didn't believe there were a reason for him to be around or interacting with the politics of the Republic. She always had an excuse for Anakin when it came to the Chancellor's requests for his presence. Anakin's emotions, on the other hand, were well taken care of. Shakti expressed to Anakin that because he was born Outside of the Order, he was allowed to express his feelings differently. He was allowed to love and care for those around him, but he wasn't allowed to fall in love. This actually made a lot of sense to Anakin, he didn't seem to have any issue with it actually. Anakin as the years and years passed, he grew in his power. He was fluent with several lightsaber forms, like his master, but not all of them. Because Anakin's emotions were kept in balance, he was able to progress extremely fast. Anakin was quite literally the clone of his master. She made him into the Jedi he needed to become. Obi-Wan Kenobi was ever so present in Anakin's life. Obi-Wan was able to grow naturally and as was Anakin. There was no tension between the two of them and this was intended by Shakti. Shakti's training led Anakin to passing the trials early in his career as a Jedi. He'd become a Jedi Knight before Attack of the Clones ever began. He would be paired with his master Shakti on missions and the two of them would keep a tight bond. The two of them would also spar often. In the eyes of the council, of which Shakti was a part of, they looked on Anakin with fondness. He wasn't arrogant, and he was patient, and he showed little to no hints of darkness within him. For Palpatine, who wanted to dig his evil nails into Anakin's skin, lost all the chances he could get. He felt that the chance to get Anakin could be coming up, but 
he had to continue to be patient. A few more years would pass before the assassination attempt on Senator Amidala would be committed over Coruscant. Anakin was worried for Padme, but it wasn't quite the same level of worry he had in canon. Palpatine suggested putting Anakin and Obi-Wan on this mission. Their bond was tight, and as the two reconvened with Padme, they prepared for this mission together. It wouldn't be long before they foiled another assassination attempt on the Senator. The Chancellor had planned for all these attempts to fail, and because Padme was a political rival, the best thing he could do was get Padme off-world during the military creation bill that was being debated by the Senate. Anakin and Padme went to Naboo as Obi-Wan Kenobi followed a red crumb trail to Kamino, and from Kamino, Kenobi would follow the bounty hunter Jango Fett to Genosis. Obi-Wan Kenobi found a droid foundry and a number of Separatist leaders present on the world. He relayed a communication to Anakin who was on Naboo, back to Coruscant. The Jedi decided that Anakin and Shakti should embark on a rescue mission together. Their missions together were flawless, having never failed before. Meanwhile, Master Yoda was being sent to Kamino to inspect the clone army. At the same time, Windu was going to organize a Jedi task force for Geonosis. Anakin departed from Padme. He was excited to work with his master again. Anakin truly didn't understand why he was so attached to Padme beforehand. After spending time with her on Naboo, he realized that she really wasn't all that great. He was ready to get on the move again, especially if he could prevent Obi-Wan from being hurt. Shakti and Anakin Skywalker met up, and then they went to Genosis together. This mission was very important. As they arrived, Obi-Wan was in a cell, and he had been captured, and Count Dooku was talking to him. Dooku was telling Kenobi about the Galactic Republic being under the control of a Sith Lord. Shakti and Anakin were sneaking around the base. They couldn't seem to find Kenobi, but Kenobi was determined to tell Dooku that he wouldn't be joining his cause. Unlike Anakin and Padme, Shakti and Anakin would sneak throughout the facility that Obi-Wan was in. They couldn't find him, but they did find the control center. The center had all the Separatist leaders. If they could capture them, the war effort could crumble before the war even began. Shakti transmitted the location to Master Windu, who was in hyperspace on his way to Genosis. Shakti and Anakin dropped from the ceiling, igniting their blades and telling everyone in the room to stand down. Pagal the Lesser, the Genosian leader, was so surprised from this that he dropped a hologram emitter on the floor. Shakti used the force and pulled it towards her and opened it. It were the plans for a super space station. Shakti was unhappy by this, but she was also confused, as she demanded where these plans came from. Anakin closed all the doors with a force as his master spoke to the Separatist Council. Not a single one of them said a word. They were all silent, and that was fine. As for Kenobi, Dooku told some Genosians to prepare him for the arena. Dooku started to make his way back to the command center to fetch Poggle the Lesser. When he arrived, the doors were locked, and he knew immediately that something was wrong. Dooku's blade cut into the door and dragged up and along the border of the door so that he could create an entrance for himself. When he entered the room, he saw two Jedi, one he was familiar with and one he didn't know. Shakti got in front of her apprentice. She knew Dooku was a powerful Jedi, formally, and she wanted to keep her apprentice safe. She knew she needed to hold him off until reinforcements arrived. Dooku was snarky, but remarked that he remembered her being a master. But did she really live up to her own standards? He knew she prided herself on her work and what she made of herself, and Dooku took advantage of this. He didn't sheathe his lightsaber as he began his fighting stance. Shakti did the same and prepared to fight someone she once looked up to. Her and Dooku clashed in a blaze of blue and red. Shakti was a fine duelist herself, and Dooku didn't expect her to rise to such power during his absence. There were few in the Order Dooku feared getting into a duel with, and he never envisioned one of those individuals to ever become Shakti. She kept Dooku away from her apprentice, and she was protecting Anakin, but Anakin saw her falter, a tad, and Dooku was ready to seize the moment, but Anakin jumped in to stop the possibly disabling strike. She was proud of Anakin, the man he became showed in this moment. Then side by side, they fought Dooku together. With Anakin's maturity and Shakti's knowledge of lightsaber combat, Dooku was in for a challenging fight. It's not that Anakin was more powerful, but he was patient, strategic, everything his master taught him to become. Dooku was put on defense. He needed to win this battle because if he didn't, all the Separatist leaders who were behind the Jedi could be captured and with that, the war effort could crumble. Dooku needed to play dirty and so without hesitation, he sent a shock of electricity at Anakin but Shakti was too fast on her feet as she blocked it back at him. 
Dooku caught off guard by her remarkable speed, fell back and out of the door. But instead of falling onto the ground, he was caught. He thought, finally, some reinforcements, but when he turned around to see who it was, it was Master Windu and a couple high council members flanking him. The Jedi had to get the Separatists off world before Yoda arrived with the clone armies. Windu sent Plo Koon, Shock T, Sassy Ten, and Anakin Skywalker back to Coruscant with the Separatist leaders and Count Dooku. The Order's best fighter pilots would be traveling back to Coruscant in case the Separatists decided to chase after them, though it wouldn't be any matter. As the Jedi boarded a shuttle and began to leave, the Republic's clone army had entered Genosis' atmosphere. The shuttle entered hyperspace and the Battle of Genosis began on the ground. The clone legions caught the Separatists off guard and the battle was catastrophic for the Seppies and now they had no leadership. Of course, General Grievous, who was present, made a great escape. He'd become leader of the Separatist military, alongside Admiral Trench and Captain Mar Took. As the battle came to a conclusion on Genosis, the shuttle landed on Coruscant with all the captured Separatist leaders. Shakti still had the Death Star plans, and, and so she and Anakin escorted the plans back to the Jedi Temple, as Plo and Sacy Tin escorted the captured Separatist leaders to a Republic maximum security prison. They stayed to keep guard, and Plo decided he would try and talk to Count Dooku. And Dooku had a similar offer for him as he did for Kenobi. He tried to convince a former friend of his to join him, though he knew that since Plo was on the council, this would be a long shot. Plo, though, used reverse psychology against him, drawing out the answers from Dooku. Dooku didn't communicate who the Sith Lord was, but he revealed a location that he was known to frequent. Plo thanked Dooku and walked away from his cell. Dooku was furious that Plo didn't join him and that he kind of tricked him, but he understood what Plo had done. Dooku found something in the room to pick his cell door open and so that he could escape, but Plo felt this in the forest as he made his way back to the cell. Dooku was just breaking out of the cell and Plo caught him off guard. Without hesitation, yellow electricity flew from Plo's hands. Dooku had never seen or heard of this before, and he was shocked as he fell to the ground. Plo knew Dooku wouldn't stay in his cell forever, and though the electric judgment wasn't painful, Dooku was stunned and knocked out. Plo placed him in the back side of his cell, and then sat outside the cell and meditated with his eyes closed. He would remain here until Dooku would be moved into a more appropriate cell. In the Jedi Temple, Anakin received intel about the Battle of Genosis, and that the Republic forces were making their way back to Coruscant after a decisive victory. Meanwhile, Shock T came into the briefing room with Jocasta Nu and a handful of archive books. Shock T placed the disc inside of the communications table, and the hologram of the Death Star opened up. Jocasta Nu placed some of the archive books on the table and began to sort through them. It wouldn't be long before the Republic returned to Coruscant and the Separatist leaders were respectfully locked away in appropriate cells. The Jedi also began to patrol and search the abandoned industrial sector without finding any clues as to what Dooku was talking about. As the Jedi caught on to the ruse to topple over the Galactic Republic and the Jedi, they had a war to fight. As such, the Jedi were sent into battlefronts with clone legions, and as this was so, the Jedi continued to study the information within the disc. As for Plo Koon, he relayed information to the Jedi Council. The Council was unsure of what to do with it, and the information they were given about the Sith's possible location in the industrial sector, of which they couldn't find. Palpatine had to conjure a new plan. The Jedi weren't spread out, and with a crippled Separatist leadership, General Grievous, who was beyond reckless, would be unhinged enough to do something risky. After the Battle of Christophsis and the rescue of Jabba the Hutt's son, which played out similarly as it did in canon, Anakin as a new apprentice would return to Coruscant. Anakin introduced Ahsoka to his master, Shakti. She was honored that Anakin was training one of her own. It felt like it represented the bond between the two, master and apprentice, would be shared down the next generation of Jedi. With the Jedi concentrated on Coruscant, a desperate move from the Separatists came without warning. Sidious was trying to control General Grievous, but without much restraint, General Grievous took a Separatist fleet with Mar Tuck and Admiral Trench and the newest Separatist flagship, the Malevolence. The fleet arrived and met face to face with the Republic defense on Coruscant. The war had just begun, but this would be the biggest battle the Republic had seen since the days of the Old Republic. The Jedi were caught off guard, so they scrambled their men and their Jedi for combat. Several ships in orbit of Coruscant were faced with Luger Hulk battleships and Admiral Trench's extremely large Providence class, while the ever so massive malevolence hid in the back of the Separatist lines. The Republic fleet, though, unready, rose to the moment. 
As ships from around the Deep Core were summoned, re the Republic was on high alert. Meanwhile, on the surface, Mace Windu and Sacy Tin led a wing of fighters into space to stop the Separatist invasion. Meanwhile, at the same time, Yoda sent Shock T, Anakin Skywalker, and Plo Koon to defend the Chancellor in his office. Again, at the same time, Yaddle, even Peel, and Kiari Mundi were sent to guard the Separatists in maximum security. Yoda and a handful of Jedi and clones prepared for the possibility of a ground invasion. And so the battle raged. It was the largest and strongest both militaries would be, especially the Separatists with the Malevolence in tow. Though in the midst of battle, a shuttle would sneak through the chaos. It comes from the Malevolence and heads towards the Senate building down on course on surface. This strike was meant to cripple the Republic, was also meant to cripple the Republic's command structure. Without knowledge of a possible victory at Coruscant, the Separatists contrived a plan that would at least make a barter for Dooku and the Separatist Council. General Grievous and a handful of Magna Guards broke into the Senate building and made their way to the Chancellor's chambers. They cut down anyone who was in their way without hesitation, whether it was senators or clones. As they came to the Chancellor's chambers, they bust down the doors. Clone troopers opened fire as three Jedi ignited their blades. Magna Guards were shot down until they started cutting down the clones who were in the room. Anakin jumped to their aid, fending off the guards as Grievous towered on in his way in. He laughed as he lunged into combat against Plo and Shock T. It was an even match though, Anakin was able to best the Magna Guards and save the clones, so he joined the fight on Grievous. The few remaining clones then used their grapple shots to shoot Grievous' legs and pull them apart. The Jedi made him yield before them, and there was nothing, absolutely nothing, he could do. Defenseless with the entire Separatist movement able to be broken here at Coruscant, General Grievous had failed. As his head dropped, he heard a big crash. Master Plo Koon was sent across the room by way of the Force. Palpatine took the most powerful duelist in the room out of combat. Ahsoka, who was standing next to the Chancellor, felt a blade go through her stomach. Palpatine wouldn't let this movement falter. And with Grievous as the perfect scapegoat, he dropped both of his blades to combat Shock T and Hennekin. They both jumped into action as Plo tried to stagger to his feet. Anakin wanted to help his apprentice who lay on the floor. He knew he couldn't now, especially because Separatist landing craft could be seen landing outside the window. Without knowledge of the rest of the battle on Coruscant for Shaq T and Anakin, all they knew is that they were the last lines of defense against the Sith. Palpatine grinned. He knew he was a superior duelist in this match. As Palpatine toyed with his opponents, he saw Grievous getting up as the clones tried to hold him down but were unable to. Plo was back to his feet, and he used Electric Judgment to shut down General Grievous by stunning him again. Palpatine grinned, turned to a frown. He now had two masters to deal with. Anakin took an offensive position against Sidious and pushed him away from Shock T. Palpatine caught on. Anakin was defending his master, and this made him happy in a sick way. He had killed Ahsoka, and he wanted to kill the only other woman in Anakin's life, someone who was so obviously important to him. As Plo joined the fight, Palpatine found himself in an odd position. Plo and Shock T were great duelists, but Palpatine was better. As he used a jab meant for Shock T, he caught Anakin in the stomach. Anakin jumped in front of his master to save her from being stabbed. He dropped to the floor, and Shock T and Plo used the force to shove Palpatine over his desk. Anakin lay in pain, he wanted to save his master, and he accomplished that much. But Shock T and Plo had to jump over the desk and continue their fight with Palpatine. Anakin turned and told the clones to execute Grievous, and the clones gunned down Grievous as he lay unconscious. Palpatine needed to escape to let the Jedi deal with this mess, but there was no way out, and that was even more evident as Master Yoda came to assist the Jedi after he received a communication from Plo Koon. The communication came while Palpatine thought he was out of the battle. Yoda saw that General Grievous was dead, but the flurry of blades at the end of the room made him leap into combat immediately. Yoda was strong enough to keep Palpatine off balance as he was now twirling facing three duelists. Giving them everything he had, he was pushed back across the room, but before he knew it, he saw a blue blade appear from within his chest. Behind him, Anakin Skywalker fell to the floor in immense pain. He used all of his strength, everything he had within him, to get up and stab Palpatine so that he could save his friends in the council. Anakin knew Shock T could help him, but as a selfless man he was, he told his master to heal Ahsoka. She, she needed to be healed. Anakin's eyes rolled back as he lay on his master's lap. Shakti looked down at her beloved student. Yoda looked at Shakti and she nodded. She gently placed him down and closed his eyes. 
Shakti walked over to Ahsoka and used the Force to heal her wound. As she awoke coughing and oh so cold, Plo Koon wrapped Ahsoka up in his robe. Anakin lay on the floor without a pulse, but Yoda also knew of an ancient Force power, the same one that Shakti was aware of. Yoda closed his eyes and before he knew it, Anakin was coughing too. He looked up and jerked his eyes over to see that Ahsoka was okay. She was being held by the Jedi who found her, Plo Koon. Anakin fell back, but before he hit the ground, Shakti slipped under him and held him in her arms. She was so happy to see him breathe again. Shakti was willing to give her life for Anakin and Ahsoka, and Yoda knew this. Yoda knew that if he hadn't told Shakti to save Ahsoka, she would have given her life for the two of them to be brought back to life. Yoda told the clones in the room to follow him. The duel had been won, but the battle itself wasn't over. On the ground, Captain Fordo and a legion of clones and Jedi fighters held a resistance against the droid invasion. In space, Windu and Tin led a group of bombers against the Malevolence. The Republic fleet was struggling, but the defensive position allowed for them to combat the Separatist fleet. It was also notable that fleets from around the Deep Core were arriving and fending off the Separatist ships at the same time. The battle was going brilliantly for the Republic. The Jedi sent in to defend the Separatist prison cells never saw a battle droid. The orbital fleet over Coruscant led by Admiral Yularen and Admiral Killian began to beat back the Seppies. As malevolence crumbled as its shields and its superweapons crumbled under bombing runs, Republic fleets just out of hyperspace tore the massive ship apart. There was no escape for the Separatist ships. They were ripped apart, Admiral Trench and Captain Mar Took died in the initial part of the assault, and the Separatist movement was crushed. Back in the Chancellor's office, Anakin hugged his master, and thanked her for saving Ahsoka. He thanked her for always being someone who was always there for him, always teaching him how to be the best Jedi he could be. Shakti held her student and tears rolled down her face. She realized that she had been everything that Anakin needed. She was always the one who was there for him, and through it all, in the end, she was the one, in victory, who stood by him. Ahsoka hugged her master as well. The Separatists would submit a peace treaty within days of the Battle of Coruscant, and surrender to the Republic. The Jedi wouldn't ever face a purge. Anakin would eventually join the High Council with his master after his apprentice would pass her trials. Obi-Wan would also begin to train a Jedi named Caleb Doom, and the galaxy would be restored to peace forever. I really hope you guys like this story. This story was a lot of fun, uh, very, very deep. I wanted, um, I wanted this one to be really, really deep because the connection between Shakti and Anakin I thought would have been very important. I think Shakti would have been honestly the perfect and probably the best master for Anakin. I think this probably could have been drawn out a little bit longer, but I'm very happy with the length of this video and how it kind of came to a conclusion. I feel like this video really understands where Shakti's relationship with Anakin would have gone. I feel like Shakti was capable enough of of understanding that though she believed in the code and who she was as an individual, she would have believed that she could have helped Anakin the most by giving him a special treatment essentially. Not not saying that Anakin was special because he's the chosen one, but giving a special giving him a special treatment because he after all was born as a slave, born into an emotion emotional world and I think recognizing that so early into his training would have helped her help him become the Jedi he was capable of becoming. I think in the story, Anakin would have been leagues more powerful than he ever was in canon, but I also believe as as sincere and kind of an individual he was in canon, I think he would have been even more so based on Shakti's training of him. And one of my favorite parts of this story is something I never really did in any of these stories, and I always try and shoot for something different in one of these stories because I, I don't want them to sound the same. Especially as those of you who discover this channel start looking around and watching some of these train series videos uh, The one thing I wanted to make different here is is that Shakti wanted to keep Obi-Wan present in Anakin's life And that makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense for Shakti to do that because Obi-Wan was the one of the only other Jedi that You know Anakin in, was introduced to when he first came to the temple and and separating him from somebody that he knew and someone that he was used to would be unfair to do to Anakin and I think that Shakti's decision to do this would have also helped uh, not only grow the the bond between Obi-Wan and Anakin but grow the bond between Anakin and Shakti. I really like where this story went I think Shakti would have instinctually taken upon a motherly role for Anakin and I think she would have definitely freed Anakin's mother from slavery I think all these are are really pivotal to the change that you see in Anakin in this story 
and I'm really content with where this went. I think I think this really went in the right direction. I'm very content with how the story came out. I think I think it's honestly truly a beautiful story, and it it's it warms your heart. It's a heartwarming story, and I, I really wanted that to come from this. I think. I think I hit the nail on the head. So tell me what you thought about this story. Tell me if you liked it or not. Uh, tell me what you what you what you want to see next. Let me know down below. I got a couple videos playing out for the week that I'm excited about. Join the Discord if you want to see what they are. Get hints or get to see thumbnails before they even show up on the premiere. I'm really excited about what we got planned for this week, and I'm really excited about this video. So I hope you guys really did enjoy this. I, I put a lot into these videos, and I hope you guys understand and know that that what I do for these videos, I really do put a lot into these. These these videos are straight from the heart, and uh, this this one isn't 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 far from this was honestly probably one of my favorite ones because of just how how deep and um, intimate and intimate can be used in multiple forms but intimate the relationship between Anakin and Shock T was in this story I think that was I think that was the best part of this and how close they could have become if 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 Shock T had been his master anyways guys I hope you guys enjoyed. I love you all. Don't forget to subscribe for a chance to win a free lightsaber and check out the Discord that I've mentioned so many times before. Anyways guys, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.